Welcome back, everybody, and new listeners, hello. This is Gorman on Gore, a podcast about horror films. I'm your host, Peter Gorman. With me, as always, is my long-suffering compatriot, Jacob. Say hello to the uh, nice people, Jacob. Yark. What? What's up? You say yark? I said hark. It's making a, oh, a reference yes. to the. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. All right. No. 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 Finish the thought. No. No. It's fine. <laughs> Just let that die on the vine. All right. I'm excited for this one. Are you excited? Hell yes, I'm excited. Yeah, we got a good one for you today, ladies and germs. This is the stuff <laughs> dreams are made of. Don't go on, don't Jacob. Say, tell them, tell them what we got for them this week. Uh, they can already tell from the episode title. But what if they're auto playing on a playlist? You know, I mean, this is important. Oh no, no, no that's true. That's no, that's a good point. That's a good point. All right, all right, all right. Uh, we're you know talking about the lighthouse by keeping secrets, are ye? No, it's not a secret. I just don't know who. I, I can't remember who directed it. Robert Eggers. There you go. That's actually the tagline of the movie. Oh, okay. Wait, is it? <laughs> it really is. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Keeping secrets are ye. Tell me, what's a timber man want? With being a wiki. Just looking to earn a living. It's like any man. Starting new. On the run. Keeping secrets, are you? No, sir. Why just spill your beans? It's a- weeks, two days, help me to recollect. It's Robert Eggers' masterclass in black and white cabin fever, The Lighthouse. And in case you've never listened to the podcast before, we do a detailed analysis of the whole film from beginning to end. We spoil everything. I would recommend... You see this film for yourself first. However, even if you did, there's no spoiling the film. <laughs> All of the events depicted might have happened, or, or none of the events depicted might have happened, or some of the events depicted might have happened. I prefer to uh, take <laughs> so, the entire plot literally. It all happened. Really? All of it? <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> I like this stance. I, I yeah. appreciated the pause. Like, would you, would you even, uh, how do you even deal with that? No, I, I, I have yeah. my own interpretation, but, uh, yeah. It, it's funny to think of the whole thing as being entirely like a literal thing that happened. It's all true. <laughs> well, it's so nuts. What if this movie had begun with that, which is like based on a true story? Uh,. I mean, it is sort of like... A man, another man, and a mermaid. Um, it is kind of... No, I, kind of, yeah, I, know, I, I do that, know it's roughly based off... That of, Flannan Lighthouse? Uh, uh, or whatever. I heard it was called the Smalls Lighthouse incident off the coast of Wales. You know, there have probably been... Uh, where, there have probably been multiple instances where uh, people have just gone yeah. nuts and just... Well, here's the... <laughs> This is the 2019 Lighthouse, by the way. There's also a 2016 Lighthouse. It's a British production. It's slightly more faithful to the thing that they borrowed the most of this from. It's about two men off the coast of Wales. I think it's called the Smalls Incident. It's like these small islands off the coast of Pembrokeshire. And one of the men died, and uh, the other one had to run the lighthouse by himself. He had to lash 
the dead body of his co-worker to the side of the lighthouse and during storms the the arm of the dead body got knocked loose and was waving at him through the window <laughs> brutal and they were trapped in a storm yeah yeah they were trapped in a storm and they never well i mean well they i mean it was just him <laughs> at this point he was able to keep the, the lighthouse lit but he was never the same afterwards the guy was just ruined and so after that they changed the whole policy for lighthouses where it used to be only two men and then it became three men hmm. so there you go also i think it's fair to say that's nice he's just I think it's fair to say they the other guy was there in spirit. In spirit. Watching him. Waiting for his moment <laughs> to strike. This is the kind of movie, I think, where the destination is not nearly so important as the journey. It's really kind of a one-size-fits-all movie. It's whatever you want it to be. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, I think so. You, you can get a lot of different things out of this movie. I, well, okay. I personally... What I, what I mean is... Yeah, I mean, we all have our theories. I mean, I assume you've got some theories. Sure, I mean, but, like, I just... Yeah, like, what I'm saying I, is, like, I like to think of this movie as a story about two dudes just having a good time together. Just hanging out. <laughs> just just yeah. being dudes. I mean, it, it, most of the time... I mean, okay, so in almost every scenario, that part of the movie is probably true. <laughs> I think they always get drunk and, and, you know, and fall over each other. I think that's true. So there is that. We have to hold on to our kernels of knowledge in this film because everything's up for grabs. I mean, I don't usually like going for that, you know, as they say, the Jacob's Ladder scenario where someone's in a dream or dying the whole movie. But this movie could be that. And I, I don't want it to be that, but it could be. No, I feel like that's, that's uh, the most boring interpretation. It is absolutely the most boring. It's like waking up from a dream at the end of a movie. You're just like, oh, man, that was scary. Yeah, no thanks. <laughs> at best, we can try to lay out a few of the most plausible scenarios, as I've said. I've got about six. But ultimately, the story is like a mirror reflection. It's just, it's whatever you want it to be. Uh, yeah. In a way, it's like a reflection on you, what you think it is. Yeah, or like... <laughs> Staring into the reflective light at the top of a lighthouse for hours and or hours. Into the abyss. <laughs> and hours. There is a lighthouse up at uh, Alki Beach. That's near my grandfather's house in Seattle. I love that beach. I was once abandoned there. That was kind of a, a whole other story. We have a big white lighthouse there, and I always thought that was the coolest thing. We used to be able to go visit it. But that was just like a little wimpy thing, and it's right on the shore. Mm. I think, well, for me personally, but I think also for a lot of people, there's a lot of melancholy and kind of romanticism for a lighthouse. Yeah. Also, San Francisco, well known for uh, its lighthouses. Or at least, it's got a lot. I don't know if it's what, yeah. maybe not well known. Whatever. Have you seen them? How many have you seen? Uh... I've only seen two, but I know there are, like, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I've only seen two, but I know that there are more than two. I, yeah. I, I saw, like, a... Yeah. I mean, I'm just looking at it now. There's, like, a top 16 or something lighthouses. Oh, my God. I, yeah, so I guess there's a lot. Us West Coasters, we're, we're real big on the whole, like, you know, romance of the water thing. But you know what? That's not fair. I think everybody who lives near water is real in love with the water that they are near. Yeah, because the ocean invariably drives you mad. <laughs> yes, it's eternal, and it wants to pull you down into its dark depths. Don't tell me you haven't to the heart of the ocean. Don't tell me you haven't thought about it looking at those those waves, the gray, uncertain waves of the Puget Sound. Its misty, complacent ambivalence. Absolutely. <laughs> The Pacific Ocean is way more impressive. The Puget Sound is pretty, pretty weak. I mean, well, I, I like it, but it's what I mean is like it doesn't have that terror and majesty that the Great Dark Ocean of the Pacific does. No, but then again, what does? Yeah, so few things do in life terrify you quite as much 
as the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> On that note. So, Jacob, my wiki. Don't, okay, don't call, <laughs> Would you recommend this film? Uh, are, are we doing that already? No, I mean, this is like just the initial. Oh, sure. I mean, yeah, absolutely. I love this movie. Yeah, thanks for listening to the podcast. Yeah, all right, guys. later. No, there's, <laughs> there's going to be slightly more. Like several hours, probably. We'll see. <laughs> I would absolutely recommend it. Though I would not begrudge anyone for playing something on their phone while they watch it. You know, that kind of no, thing. No, I also... It's a little undemanding of your attention if you don't wish to give it to the film. If you know what I mean. Yeah, I also... I, I did give some thought into, like, how how would you explain to someone what it is specifically? What's well, no, 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 no. Just, what do you like about this movie? What makes it such a good movie? And yeah. it's very hard to explain it without uh, sounding like a crazy person. Yeah, because in the end, it's just two relatively unpleasant men just kind of sniping at each other and slowly going mad. Which, as a description, it just sounds terrible, but... I mean, but it's also... It's, it's great, it, I mean, it's, it's so much more than that. It's <laughs> fart jokes, people drinking gin, yes, people jerking off. Uh, all of yeah, life's yeah. Uh, little pleasures. <laughs> All of them. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what do we got for the cast here? I mean, this might take a minute because there's... Let me just, let me count, let me count. Two people in this movie. <laughs> well, okay, there's actually a couple of other stand-ins, you know, and, and the mermaid, I guess, counts. Yeah. But yeah, it's really just two guys. Yes. <laughs> so we got, we got Willem Dafoe. He's playing a, a craggy-faced wiki named thomas wake and then we have robert pattinson who will be future batman he's playing ephraim winslow question mark uh yeah or possibly another man at any rate whoever he is he's the assistant wiki are you confused yet everybody you will be <laughs> you will be <laughs> uh Lord. So let's get to it, shall we? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So right off the bat, it's black and white. It's a, a boxy frame. It doesn't take up the whole screen. So right off the bat, you just get this feeling like, oh, well, this is some kind of like Dickensian kind of Moby Dick type situation. Boo, I don't want to watch an old movie. Boo. <laughs> don't pretend to be old. <laughs> what, are you doing? what are you doing pulling this young Frankenstein crap? <laughs> Yeah. There's like a terrible noise. I believe it's the 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 like a foghorn or something, some kind of a boat yeah. horn. And out of the mist walks. I'm just gonna call him Arpats for most of the movie because no, I'm not no. sure which person he no, is. No, you call it. You don't want to call him Arpats. That's Peter. That's dumb. We're just calling him Winslow. Okay. I'm stopping that right here and now. <laughs> that's not okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Fine. We'll call him Carl Winslow. I, all right. You twisted all my right, arm. Fair enough. There's a changing of the guard. Two men approach a lighthouse. Two men leave a lighthouse. That's right. We two have, men enter, two men leave. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty generic. You know, just like, oh, we're done. So and now it's your turn to be isolated on this island of horrors. So, yeah. The, uh, we have the grizzled old wiki who's Willem Dafoe and his new assistant, Winslow, or Robert Pattinson. They don't introduce themselves early on, so I'm, I might go back and forth on the names. That's what this kind of movie is like. They don't even bother to be like, yeah, here is who I am. They're just people. They're just people walking up to a lighthouse. Peter, you don't get They're dudes. Dudes can just hang... All right, dudes. Yeah, two manly men. Dudes can just hang out. With manly, bushy beards. No, dudes can just hang out together and not give each other names. or like, know anything about our, you know, their lives. That's just how dudes are. Just give each other that knowing nod. Yeah. Ah, fellow man. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Robert Pattinson... I'm, I'm going to try to call him Winslow. I, I want to call him Arpats. This is going to be hard for me. Okay, so Winslow... Walks in on Willem Dafoe's character, you know, Wake, pissing into a chamber pot and, and farting. 
and uh, their room looks really cramped. Yes. It's kind of weird because it's, it's weird because when you see the outside of the building, there's this big, tall lighthouse, and then there's a long building connected to it that has another building. It, it, to me, it looked like Popeye's arm, like flexing. There's like quite a lot of building. So I can't figure out why they're in this horrible room. It's like at the top of, a, of an attic or something. It's just, you get, you, you've got the two angles of the roof, you know, intruding on their space. Yeah. So they have to almost like bow to each other to get into and out of bed. I, I imagine that building is probably full of supplies that they need. <laughs> yeah, except for, you know, in this instance, when they very badly need it and it's not. Well, bad. yeah. Well, you know, well later, okay, later actually, on. We'll, we'll get to yeah, it. Come yeah. on, man. Okay, so yeah, Winslow already looks miserable, but that is one. I know our pet's fine looking. I, I, I want to keep saying ah. Defoe's character calls him pretty as a picture in the film, and he honestly he is. He's got a good lumberjacky look. He's got a bushy mustache. He's got a I don't know what it is, like kind of a Boston accent. He's got the kind of ahs on his a's. Yeah, like ah, just goddamn thoughts. And I don't know what the hell Willem Defoe's accent is. It's salty old sea person. The, the the ageless accent of the sea. Yes. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's kind of a little bit pirate and a little bit uh, Willem Dafoe, I, I guess. Yeah. I mean, without going into it yeah. too much, I almost feel like, given some of the things said later on, that it's got to be like intentional put on on his part, but he never he never lets up on it. Yeah, I mean, he's always he's always talking in rhyme or or saying something bizarre. He uses the the what's in that old timey wrong way that I hate, you know. <laughs> Angry at those what cross him, you know that kind of yeah. Thing. Even the way we should use what and need to go back to. <laughs> I really don't like it. it. It was in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Two when Taser Face kept saying the the what's that way, and it just drove me. Oh, nuts. I don't even remember that. Yeah, you know. It's not worth it. Yeah. Nah. The character is horrible. He existed just to be laughed at. Yeah. Okay. So, as I said, our, uh, Winslow, this is his first time there, or at least it's assumed, because, I mean, like I said, there's not a lot of talking early on, or at least not about things that are important. So, he's unpacking, and he finds a little carven scrimshaw mermaid in his bed, mm -hmm. and I'm just like, score? Like, that's, that's awesome. Uh, that reminds me of... Um... I mean, I guess we should we'll get into this early. It reminds me of a, an H.P. Lovecraft story called The Temple. Oh. It's the one that... Which one is it's that It's the one? one with the uh, Nazi submarine crew where uh, Lovecraft gets into his favorite kind of racism, which is, like, inter-white people racism. <laughs> Jesus. Which is, like... It, no, it's great, because he, he's, like, he... The main character's, like, a Nazi who's constantly insulting the other crew members for being, like, filthy Rhinelanders and stuff like that. Come on, man. Oh. <laughs> yeah. God, I don't remember that story at all. I, it's a good I one. i to go back and, and read him. Well, maybe not. I don't know. I almost wish there was a racism filter on the old Lovecraft stories. <laughs> I, you know, whatever. It's, okay, it's literally racism against other Nazis. Yeah. Well, this time, anyway. Well, it, well, sure, sure, <laughs> sure. I'm just saying. This time, it's just kind of funny. And in case anyone doesn't know, scrimshaw is... I think it's just a term for any carved ivory figure. Uh, it's often uh, like a tusk, or sometimes it's from the bone. Or like It could be whalebone. I assume this mermaid is, is, a, is a scrimshaw whalebone. Yeah. I hope, it's, I hope it's the dork, you know, which is the whale penis. Uh, I think that could be... I don't know if you know, but it actually... It, there, there's a bone in there. Yeah, I, I did know that. I don't know why I knew that, but yeah. I picked I picked that up at some point in my life. Okay, so yeah, like I said, Winslow has unpacked his things for the first time. He finds an idol. Willem Dafoe's character, who later introduces himself as Thomas Wake, he's grizzled, he's gross, he farts, he seems real grumpy. I don't know. They don't. They already don't seem to like each other, and they haven't even really spoken yet. And so then they have their first dinner together. 
and Willem Dafoe basically forces him to drink. You know, he wants to do a toast. I mean, in a way, it makes sense. He's like, listen, this is our first dinner together. And, well, he doesn't say it this eloquently. But, <laughs> so this is our first dinner together. And, you know, I want to toast, you know, like, uh, this mission, this journey we're taking together. Mm -hmm. Winslow is just like, no. And I get the sense, I don't know if they say, I mean, they show later, but I, I, I get the sense that Winslow doesn't like himself when he drinks, that he becomes too belligerent. Or, or maybe he doesn't feel like he can control himself when he's, when he's wasted. Yeah, that is, that is the impression I got. Also, yeah. frankly, I don't know how you feel about it, but just drinking a cup of gin straight just seems miserable. Yeah, it's, it's like, I don't know, I mean, for those who haven't had gin, it, it's essentially, what is it actually, juniper berries or just yeah. something? But it, it tastes like pine needles. Yeah. And it's pretty unpleasant. You usually have to chase it with something or, or mix it. Gin and tonic is the classic, but you can do lots of stuff. I'm not sure that there's any version of it that I particularly like. But, you know, uh, everyone's got their own things. Yeah, I mean, I don't mind gin, but, like, just, like, the idea of just, like, later on when they're just... Just straight up. Just chugging a bottle, it's like, that... I would throw up. It is too much. Yeah. So Defoe says, you know, bad luck to leave a toast unfinished. Which is really more how he talks. He's just sort of, I'm talking in a piratey tone. <laughs> so he's, you know, a little superstitious, a little overbearing. Mm. Uh, he utterly insists on the toast. And then, uh, oh yeah, that's right. Defoe and Winslow. Winslow right off the bat is like, okay, well, what are, what are our rounds? And Willem Defoe lays out all of the things he needs to do. He's like, oh, you gotta, you know, you gotta scrub the floors, you gotta clean out the cistern, you gotta, you know, you gotta whitewash the light, lighthouse, all this mundane stuff. And and then Winslow's like, okay, well, when do I get to do the watch? I mean, I, I want to, when do I get to be up there with the lamp? And Defoe's just like, uh, ah, never. I take the dread watch, which is a uh, night to morning, apparently. Hmm. Right off the bat, it's a little weird with Willem Defoe's character making a lot of strange demands. And being really bizarre, and saying little fun sailor witticisms, which unfortunately I've forgotten. I should have written it down. But it's also really hard to follow him. So I mean, I would have had to have put on captions and, <laughs> you know, just pause for a while and try to figure out which old sea chanty he's saying or whatever. Yeah, he's got some good ones. Yeah, there's a few good ones in here. Yeah. So Winslow has to shovel coal, which he does not enjoy. Who'd have thunk it? Yeah. And then you get the first shot of Willem Dafoe's character up in the lighthouse, up in the, I think they call it the lamp room. Mm -hmm. He's just looking dazed and offering a cup to the light and just says, to ye. <laughs> he's, he's toasting the light. Oh, yeah, he's just, I guess. He's having a blast up there. Yeah. He's seen multiple times throughout the movie being naked up there. I don't remember if he is the first time, but he certainly gets around to it quite quickly. Yeah, I think he, I think he like, strips, but he doesn't, he doesn't start naked like he does in so many other scenes. <laughs> so at night, Winslow sees a great raft of sawn lumber float across the water to their volcanic island. Oh, I forgot to mention that. They are on a super remote island. It's like, it's volcanic rock. They are totally surrounded by water. They have to take a boat to get there. So they are utterly isolated. And they're going to be there for a whole month. Yeah. So this is the first instance where maybe Winslow is dreaming, or maybe he's not. I, I'm not sure. But he sees all these logs floating across the water. He swims out to them. Mm -hmm. I don't know why he thinks to do that. But there's a body in the middle of them. Like There's like a circle of logs around a dead body. But when he gets there, it's gone. And then he sees a mermaid swimming out from the depths of the, of the ocean. And emitting a piercing siren song. Or maybe a scream. Kind of depends on how you want to take I, it. I definitely got more scream out of that than anything. Huh. The next morning, or maybe some other time, <laughs> uh, Winslow goes to... I thought he was cleaning a, an outhouse mm -hmm. or a latrine. He is not. That is the cistern. So he's like... He's plugging his nose as though he's like got the worst smell ever com coming out of this hole. 
I was convinced when I first saw it, I actually wrote it down that he was cleaning out an outhouse by pouring in some, a bag of white stuff, some kind of disinfectant, I'm guessing. But it's not. It's the water they're drinking. Uh, yeah. So he just yeah. pours in a bag of whatever that stuff is. And I guess that's cool. Uh, I mean, uh, hopefully that's all it needed, whatever was in that bag. <laughs> yeah. Not quite sure. Oh, I, I will say, I did like that horrible bag that he has to carry with the strap that goes around his forehead. Yeah. It's very old-timey. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure when this movie's supposed to be set. I mean, the Smalls Lighthouse incident happened... Uh, Oh, it was either 1801 or 1831. I forget which one. But anyway, it's around that, that time. This movie was originally based off of a, an unfinished story by Edgar Allan Poe called The Lighthouse. Mm -hmm. It was being written by uh, Edgar's brother. I forget his name. One of them is named Max. I think the director is. And then his... Oh, I forget. It might be Peter, but uh, I'll, I'll look it up afterwards. I wrote it, it down somewhere. Robert and Max. Oh, is it? Okay. okay. I'll go with that. Robert and Max. But anyway, uh, the brother uh, was writing this lighthouse story while his more successful, presumably, brother was making The Witch. And so afterwards, he's like, oh, we should just make this. And so now this, this movie has no resemblance to the Edgar Allan Poe story at all, other than the title. The, uh, the Edgar Allan Poe story is quite short, since it's unfinished. Yeah, I hear it's unfinished. I never read it, so I don't know what what it's about. Yeah, you yeah you really couldn't make that into a movie. Wait, so wait, have you read it? Um, no, I I have like seen like a summary of what it's about, and it's just like it's like it, it's like <laughs> all right, boom, 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 and then it's done. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I, I can't imagine there's much to it. Okay, so getting back to the to the story here. Yeah. I, I, I have it right, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I actually have the story up right now. It's like, it's basically one long paragraph, one very short paragraph, and then one, like, medium paragraph. It's the, Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. They were his last words before he died. Wouldn't be sad if that's the last thing you're doing as, like, a, a successful writer. You know, you're you're starting to write a story, but it's like a bad draft. And then you feel a heart attack coming on. You're like, no, I have to burn this before someone sees it. No, no. Ah! They'll think it was important. It wasn't important. <laughs> that's, got to, that's probably happened. You'd think. Okay. So Winslow's mending the shingles on the roof. And he spies Defoe um, acting strangely in his bed. Yes. As we could say. Yes. Acting very strange indeed. Well, okay, I, I think he's humping a pillow. I don't really know. I don't I don't know if I want to know. Yeah, I mean, I kind of personally like the idea that his bed also has a hole in it. And, uh, well. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> nothing but, that is nothing but, nothing but hair in there. Oh, God. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, so later, <laughs> Winslow is wheeling a wheelbarrow of coal, but is interrupted by a rude seagull that flies down and refuses to move out of his way. Damnable bird! I've heard in descriptions that the bird is one-eyed. I didn't notice it when I watched it myself, and I think this is the second time I've seen this film. I did notice that. Do you think it's Odin? I... You know... I... He used to take the shape of a bird. No, I know. I, I was like, I was kicking around a theory about that, but I was like, I could never get it to go anywhere, you know? No, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Because, I mean, spoiler alert, uh, this bird dies later, like, real hard. Oh. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, like, Mortal Kombat fatalities, that thing. <laughs> yeah, it's shocking. We'll get to it. Yeah, we'll get to it. <laughs> All right, so these, these early shots are kind of just establishing a lot of the mundane duties that Winslow is doing over the course of the first few days or weeks. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. The movie's real weird about time. So, I mean, it's it could be a day. It could be a couple of days. Yeah. It could be months, maybe. I, well, okay. So this movie's supposed to happen, or at least the first part is supposed to happen over the course of four weeks. So that's probably what happens. I think everything's mostly 
tangible at the beginning, you know, a, a, a story you can understand with a with a with a timeline. Mm. But later on, it gets a little weird. So anyway, Winslow is carrying a great tank of something up the spiral stair of the lighthouse. I believe it's a, a tank of kerosene. Yeah, I, I will. Defoe tells him he didn't need to bring up the whole thing. He's like, you could have just brought up this little pot to refill the lamps. I, I will say, I, I did write a note while watching the scene that it was basically to the effect of, how did they not account for people having to carry that thing up a huge flight of stairs? And it's like, oh, okay, yeah, <laughs> no, they did, they did, all right. Yeah, it's so impractical. <laughs> yeah, it turns it, well, it, well, the thing is, he, the tank is enormous. It's it's almost bigger than he is, and he and somehow he got it up. However many stories of spiral staircase. Yeah. Defoe tells him, yeah, he didn't need to bring it up and then curses him for a slow dullard and says he's behind in his duties. So he's not even cool about it. You know, he's just, uh, he's, he's giving grief like right off the bat. Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, I found out that lighthouse lights don't have one big light. They actually have a bunch of little lights. So up there, there was probably at least six lamps that were probably all individually refilled with the kerosene. And then those reflector lights kind of turned it into one big light. Mm -hmm. In case you were curious. Lighthouse facts. They share a meal. Winslow is in no mood to chatter with the old sea salty Defoe. Defoe says something ominous about boredom making men evil, which is kind of true. Yeah. It's kind of a idle hands make the devil's work or... Something to that effect. I mean, I think there's a little bit of truth to that. Yeah, there was something I was thinking about with old uh, maritime stories I've read, where I've heard that people always need to be doing something. So when the old sailors would run out of stuff to do, they'd have to pick oakum out of between the planks of the uh, of the ship. Hmm. Oakum was like part of the stuff that was the caulk that held the wood together. Or maybe it was something that was in there. At any rate, it was just like little hairs. So they would just have to, you know, bow down. If there was nothing else to do, the whole crew, or however many didn't have something to do, would have to just pick hairs out of the floor. And the whole idea was just that they always had to have a job to be done, because if you didn't have a job to do, you're just standing around in a boat that's trapped, you know, in the middle of a vast, unknowable ocean, and you're only thinking about the existential dread of it all. And so I think there, there's probably some of that in the lighthouse as well. Yeah, that's a good way to uh, succumb to sea madness. Yeah. I would say uh, Wake does offer the alternative of uh, just drink. <laughs> yeah, you can just do that. Yeah. Winslow asked what became of the prior assistant, and Defoe tells him the man went mad, saw mermaids, believed that there was enchantment in the light, Winslow brushes off Defoe's warning not to fight any seabirds. And Defoe straight up slaps him right in the face. Yeah. Whoops. Bad luck to kill a seabird. I d well, yeah, he said something about the, the, the seabirds have the souls of the dead. They're souls of sailors what met their maker. Yeah, yeah. I believe is how he says it. What met their maker. <laughs> I've never heard of this before, but I can't exactly rule it out. Well, it reminds me of the uh, rhyme of the ancient mariner. I think there's just something about not disturbing the, the balances around you when you are in such a precarious position and you are so at the mercy of wild forces that are just eons beyond your control. Yeah. I will say, so when Wake slaps Winslow, Winslow has such a, a look of just being taken aback that someone would slap him in the face. Yeah. It's very wonderful. Yeah, and then Defoe just plays it off like nothing happened. Yeah. I, I yeah. Just like, well, just imagine yourself, this is like probably the second, maybe third day on the job. What would you do if your manager just slaps you in the face? <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't even know, I don't, yeah, I think I'd be about as taken aback as he was. It's just like, I don't even know what to say here. <laughs> I mean, what's he going to do? Complain to HR? Yeah, and Defoe is just is just like, he, he just acts all cavalier about it. He's just like, oh, I'll put on some coffee for us. Don't mind me. Yeah. 
you know you're going to be trapped with this person for like at least a month. So I think that would almost be worse. Like it would it'd be so much better to be surprised by a crazy person rather than know the whole time you're with a crazy person. Yeah, uh, that makes sense. Well, I mean, is it better to know there's a bomb that's going to blow you up in a couple of hours or to not know and, and just die? There's a bomb that's going to blow us up in a couple of hours? I was thinking of that old Hitchcock thing. He was talking about the uh, creation of suspense, mm -hmm. where you show a bomb under a table with two men talking to each other. Hitchcock mentions that the two men don't know about the bomb, but the audience does. And so the tension is created for the audience, but not for the characters. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> you could have spared him all of this if you just saved your crazy for a while. It could have given him a couple of weeks or, where he just thinks everything's cool. Before it's too late. Well, but then man. again, what all could happen in a lighthouse job? I mean, I guess it's not like you expect like a lot of things to go wrong. There's not a lot of things that even happen. All they're doing is keeping a light lit. Yeah. At night, Winslow sees Defoe naked up in the light. So <laughs> this is the second time he sees him up there, but this might be the first time he sees him naked. The or maybe shirtless. It's it's not clear. So like the lighthouse has a lot of funny moments. In it, I mean, it's like it's a suspenseful movie. It's definitely a horror movie, but there's that that little bit where you see that silhouette of naked Willem Dafoe just projected back against <laughs> the building Winslow came from, and it's like that's just yeah. that's great. Yeah, I mean, you gotta you gotta change up the tone a little bit, otherwise it just becomes unbearable. Yeah, and they do that, or at least they attempt to do that. I think successfully. By just upping the absurdity of both characters occasionally. Yeah. Oddly enough, it's not even implausible because people get weird, especially when they're super isolated and are bored out of their minds. Oh, yeah, definitely. So the next morning, Wake accuses Winslow of not scrubbing the floor. And he points somewhat off camera. You don't see for sure what it is he's pointing at. Mm -hmm. So maybe he did or maybe he didn't. Winslow says he already scrubbed it twice. I don't know who to believe, actually. Yeah, I'm not sure either. I, you know, I guess my first impression at the time was that uh, Wake was just being unreasonable. I think he was just doing it to ruffle his feathers and gaslight uh, Winslow a little bit. If I might be so bold as to use that <laughs> phrase. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, I know you did it. I was just playing with you, boy. He does go out of his way to push Winslow's buttons. So I I feel like that is like part of that. Yeah. And then we come to the great scene where Wake dangles Winslow over the side of the lighthouse from the very top of it. <laughs> to, I, I think they're whitewashing the building. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I You could not get me to do that. I was thinking something similar. It, it's like being a window washer on a skyscraper. Yeah, just no, no thanks. Yeah, yeah, Winslow's sitting on a plank of wood that's held on all four corners by tied rope, it looks like. Yeah. And, you know, Winslow correctly points out that nobody's going to see this. I mean, it doesn't even matter. Mm -hmm. Wake says, uh, oh, you're getting high marks in me book, boy. Just keep going. <laughs> and then he just starts wiggling him around. I, yeah. I don't know what's happening. I, I, yeah. I, I'm i starting to wonder if Wake actually does try to kill him or if he's just messing with him or maybe he's screwing up, but he's too proud to admit it because he's old. And so he's starting to lose his grip on Winslow, but doesn't want to say so. It could be any of those things because you don't see any of it. You're just from Winslow's perspective. So it just starts shaking like crazy. And he's like, oh, what are you doing, old man? Yeah. And the guy's just like, oh, don't worry about it. Stop moving around. He's like trying to blame him for it. And then he just drops. And I'm not sure how far of a drop it is, but it's real far. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, it's not super far, but it's like far enough where it's like, yeah, that would, that's not great. Oh, he yeah. doesn't I mean, see he's temporarily, he's like knocked out for a minute. Yeah, although, yeah, I guess he, like, doesn't seem like he suffers from, like, too much, like, long-term pain from it, but, like, I feel like that would mess you up pretty bad. No, I mean, he just gets briefly knocked out. He wakes up, and that one-eyed seagull is there picking at his leg. Yeah. 
I mean, you know for, what? I don't know. I'm starting to think this seagull had it coming. Yeah, I was gonna say at a certain point, it's kind of yeah. I was like not to like victim blame about this, but like bird kind of had it coming. Just you know, like, like at a certain point, just leave some, leave him alone. Yeah. Somewhere in this point in the movie is when they mention there's two weeks remaining. So half of their time has now expired. It went by just like that. It sure did. <laughs> Winslow finally introduces himself as Ephraim Winslow. So they were hanging around with each other for two weeks, didn't even bother to tell each other their names. Like I said, man, dudes can just hang out. Yeah, I guess. Defoe asks what brought a man such as him to such a lonely job. He says, what kind of a man? He says, pretty as a picture. And he's like, ah, that's kind of sweet, I guess. <laughs> I He, I mean, I was going to like save this for a little later on. He definitely seems to have like, there's something going on there. Like, it's not, there's a lot of things going on. Yeah, there's, it's, it's not nothing. <laughs> Winslow says that he was a, a timber man up in Canada. And Defoe says, they work one man harder than two horses up there. And then uh, Arpats asks if Defoe ever married. And Defoe just sort of looks off wistfully and says, 13 Christmases at sea, little ones at home. She never forgave it. And that's the first and last you ever hear of anyone associating with Defoe's character. Yeah. I think, like, I think he, like, brings it up, maybe, like, or I guess there's, like, an anecdote later on where he talks about people he, like, encountered. But, yeah, he yeah. seems like he led a pretty solitary life. I mean, other than his former assistant, he doesn't seem to really associate with anyone. I assume he took the lighthouse job because he's so unbearable that nobody can stand him for much longer <laughs> than that. I mean, he's four week intervals, max. He's not that bad. He wonders aloud whether Winslow is a felon on the run. Winslow denies it. It is unclear whether or not that is true. <laughs> Just as everything else in this movie is unclear whether it is true. Oh, yeah, they mentioned that they, they're earning uh, 630 to maybe $1,000 a year attending lighthouses. That sounds like a lot of money for, you know, 18 whatevers. Yeah, I'm not sure what the uh, conversion rate on that is. I was trying to think of what kind of a job it would have to be now to be this level of isolated and remunerated, I guess. I, I was thinking maybe if you had a job up in, like, Antarctica. Well, no, down in Antarctica or up in the North Pole. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, everything else is so interconnected. You could still just be playing crap on, on a, you know, on the internet while you're at some dreadful lighthouse job yeah i mean like well they're also like uh, there's like long haul like crabbing boats and whatnot you know oh yeah deadliest catch guys yeah you kind of do have to have a story like this take place before cell phones <laughs> honestly cell phones are the biggest killer of horror movies of maybe anything in cinema yeah Time passes, work is done. They show a lot of uh, Winslow doing a lot of the same jobs. Shoveling coal, wheelbarrowing the coal, cleaning out the cistern, fixing the shingles. It looks for a minute like Defoe has a hidden shrine that he closes up. Turns out it's actually a writing desk that you know folds into itself. Mm -hmm. I think those are cool. Apparently that's kind of a nautical thing because they're trying to save space in a captain's cabin. So they have things that kind of fold into themselves. That makes sense. Kind of like a campaign chest or something like that. Winslow cannot sleep at night, so he gets up and investigates the lighthouse. Up at the light, he can hear Defoe moaning with pleasure, and goo is dripping down. A tentacle slathers up about from up above, and a strange creature warbles. I'm not sure how much of that is true, if any of it. It might be a dream. Or he might be seeing something happening, or maybe he's misinterpreting something. So it, it seems like a hallucination, but it's partly true. I don't know. I prefer to think that it's true. <laughs> All of it? The 
Well, the I mean, I mean, like tentacles and the goo. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. I thought the creature warble sounded a little bit like the Jurassic Park Velociraptors. Not when they're doing the attack howl, but you know when they're doing the lower one that they were doing a lot more of when they were chasing the kids in the kitchen. Uh, I don't know that one. If you could maybe uh, do an impression of it. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I can't even think of how you... No. I, <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. Okay, well, if you play back that scene from the lighthouse when <laughs> Defoe is... <laughs> Doing something with a sea creature. Yeah, like, that's the that, sound I'm talking about. Look, let's just call it what it is. <laughs> Having an encounter with some kind of a horrible hentai monster. Probably, yeah. <laughs> Which, uh... Okay, so Winslow finds... <laughs> Winslow yeah. finds the water... <laughs> I'm going to change the subject, but... No, um... Yeah, uh, yeah, let's move along. Where was it? Oh, yeah. So Winslow finds the water is bad again. It tastes bad. So he goes out to the cistern and finds a dying seagull inside. <laughs> it's not even dead. It's dying. So no, when he opens yeah. up the thing, it, it looks at him. <laughs> it looks at him. Hey, what are you going to do about this? I, how did he get in there? Why is he dying? Yeah. I, all of it is so troubling to me. It's like a seagull forced its way inside somehow, or maybe, hmm, maybe it was it was sitting on the edge, and then you know maybe the the lid was up, and uh, and then a breeze blew it over. I, that's the only thing I could imagine making that work. Yeah, I mean the only other option is either semi mystical or uh, intentional sabotage. Yeah, spite by birds that hate him. Yeah. So yeah, the water's ruined. And then a, another seagull comes down and mocks him, just crows right in his face. And uh, it's the one-eyed seagull again. Yeah. So he uh, he seizes the bird and just savagely beats it to death right there in the cistern. Goes to town on that bird. <laughs> Holy yes, he shit. And you have to watch the whole thing. Oh, yeah. He is just, like, well past... First three strikes, like, sorry, like, that thing's dead, and he is just, he does not stop. Yeah, I mean, it gives you the first indication, well, the first clearest indication that there's something, uh, maybe wrong with this guy. It's also just really hard to watch, just because it just keeps going. <laughs> it's very rare to see this kind of animal brutality in movies nowadays. No, but Peter, that's what makes it such a, uh, classic comedic moment. <laughs> And, you know, honestly, maybe the first hit or two, yeah, perhaps a, for a moment I was just like, oh, that's kind of funny. But then it just keeps going and you're just like, oh, God, this is this is all wrong. <laughs> See, I don't know. I feel like I feel like the first few was like, wow, that's pretty brutal. And then it's like, OK, all right, this is pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting. We've got almost exact opposite reactions. Yeah. There's a flock of seagulls up above him. And they all cry out as if it was a great injustice. And then the weather vane shifts. The warm westerly wind has subsided, and a nasty nor'easter is coming on. It is the day before Winslow leaves, mm. and he's almost done. It's almost over. One day away from retirement. Yeah. <laughs> they share lobster for dinner, and Defoe insists that they drink on it, and they go into heavy drinking really fast. I mean, like, really fast. I, I was shocked at how much they were able to clear in a real short amount of time. <laughs> I think yeah. they did a bottle and, you know, just a couple of drinks. Uh, yeah. Just like, bam! Bam! They sing a bunch of silly old songs. I only have one lyric I wrote down. Here comes Jack with a nine-month pay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> which is 100% a silly sailor song. Because you know that right after they're done with their sailing mission, they get like a year's pay, and they're about to just go fritter it away on the stupidest stuff. I I mean, wouldn't you? Money. Well, yeah. I feel like you're in Booze and women. Gambling. I'm having trouble connecting to the internet. Uh. Take a look oh, God, what is that? Hold on. 
a, a computer is talking to me. <laughs> Do you have an Alexa? Sorry, occasionally uh, a TV will talk to me. <laughs> well, I guess now we all know that Alexa is in his room. Or apartment. Wait, wait where the hell are you? No, it's a room. It's an apartment, right? Yeah. <laughs> Alexa, order Jacob some gifts. Uh, I already turned it off. No. Oh. Worth a shot. Okay. Uh, yeah. Too bad. Yeah. <laughs> they sing. They sing songs. They're they're super duper drunk. Winslow bitterly asks why he was never allowed to man the light. His manual said it was something that they were both supposed to take turns doing. They start to argue about it, but then they do that thing like they both remember that they're he's right about to leave. So they kind of like point at each other and laugh like, ah, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you scamp. We're not going to address this anymore, but yeah, well, I'm on good terms. Oh, and this, this is the moment. This is the moment when the foe finally introduces himself. He's Thomas Wade. Oh yeah. Call me Tom. So yeah, this is exactly two weeks, not two weeks, four weeks. So, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. So, two weeks in, Ephraim Winslow introduces himself. Two weeks more pass. Then he, <laughs> Tom Wake introduces himself. Like I said, just two dudes that's, hanging that's out. That's just nuts. Just two guys. Just yeah, two guys. Just two guys. I was about to say, this next part's confusing. But, you know, every part's confusing in this. But, you know, they go on drinking, and then Winslow wakes up hungover, sprawled on the floor. Wake lies snoring nearby. Winslow goes to empty out their chamber pots. Okay, out Peter. the wind on the high cliffside. Peter, yeah. before we get uh, too far away uh, from that, did you ever, uh, in all of your watching of this movie, just take a moment to uh, pause the movie real quick when it pans down to the two chamber pots? Uh, no, why? Oh, because I, I did, just out of curiosity. Terrible, terrible curiosity. And uh, they have taken some monster dumps. And you can see, <laughs> and, yeah, and you can see them just floating in there. It is oh. awful. And they are, like, filled to the brim. Uh, I so, wonder if they were saving it up, which is even worse, really. I, I yeah, I'm not sure. Two days but, worth of poo in here. I good lord, yeah. I could tell that Robert Pattinson is miserable doing this scene, but his character is miserable too. So I feel like it probably informs the performance in a good way. So he he walks out in this horrible weather and the and the, the the bad wind and just throws out the pots and the wind just blows it all right back into his face. <laughs> <laughs> and honestly yeah it's a wonderful moment i just love his scream afterwards of frustration of disgust of self-loathing oh yeah that's oh. Uh, it's pretty bad <laughs> it's so much worse when you know it's in there so again this is i i think it was their last day but now winslow is just going around doing stuff you know he's emptying out the chamber pots he brings wet coal to the generator. They showed him putting a cover on the coal before. I think it's so that it stays pristine so you can actually burn it properly. But as the movie progresses, it just gets wetter and wetter by the rain where he doesn't even bother to cover it up. Jacob, I thought that I might favor you with a bit of a, a bit of Coleridge, the rhyme of the ancient mariner. Um, is this something you'll be singing to us? No, it's more of a spoken verse kind of a thing. I think the death of the seagull is supposed okay. to be is sort of something... like the killing of the albatross in the story. So I'm just going to read that line from when he did it. The man okay. shoots an oh. albatross that's following following the ship with a crossbow it seems and this is what is written and i had done a hellish thing and it would work em woe 
For all averred, I had killed the bird that made the breeze to blow. Ah, wretch, said they, the bird to slay that made the breeze to blow. And that's that. It actually goes on for another 30 pages or something, but we're not going to go into that. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. We'll save that for our other podcast. Yeah. Stay tuned for the Patreon podcast. <laughs> it's actually really hard to find a concise bit of the rhyme of the ancient mariner. I'm just going to say that I was I was happy. I found one verse that really just sums it up. You know, where he's just sort of like, "Oh, I shot the albatross, and boy, does that suck!" Because it changes the wind, it curses yeah. the crew; they all die. Only he lives, and he and he's allowed to live, the, the main character, so that he can tell a sad story to other people. That is the rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. It's like the ring. You have to keep passing it on. Oh, it's, it's a little bit messed up. They should, they should really just play like, well, actually, I guess him. It, yeah, well, it's not exactly, it's not exactly the ring. It's, it has to be the same guy. So I wonder if he has to keep telling it or he'll die. I'm not sure. I, yeah. It sets up that old precedent that uh, killing birds just leads to hardship. You know, it, it just leads to hard feelings with the forces of nature. Yeah, I mean, I feel like sea. in general, just like, don't maliciously uh, kill animals. Just seems like a bad time. Yeah. First off, let's just recap the whole thing. Two men on the lighthouse. They've been there for four weeks. They don't like each other. They drank themselves into a stupor to celebrate the last day. And then... The younger man who's about to leave just gets up and starts going about his job as if he's staying there. So I don't know if he forgot. Maybe he's so hungover he doesn't realize. Or maybe this is in the future. Or maybe it's all a lie. I don't know. Or maybe the boat came and, and Willem Dafoe's character, you know, Thomas Wake, just told them to leave without him. Yeah, I kind of, I did kind of wonder if something I, like I don't know. happened. Yeah. Oh, I forgot. This is also the first, or no, I guess it's technically the second time Winslow sees the mermaid. He, he's returning back from shoveling the coal, and he sees a body out on the rocks, and he runs out there, and it turns out it's a, a naked mm -hmm. woman covered in seaweed, pale as a corpse. It looks like a Russian supermodel, maybe? Uh, I, I don't know why <laughs> Russian, but I mean, I go... Oh. Okay, no, no, I get it, because she's, like, washed up ashore dead. That's makes, makes sense. <laughs> no, it, it was her name. Uh, give me a second. I, I, I can dig okay. it up. Uh, her name is Valeria Caramon, and it's got two eyes in Valeria. So, I, I don't know, maybe she's something Middle Eastern. Not Middle Eastern, uh, East European, maybe, or Slavic. I have no idea. Uh, yeah. Anyway, he's real enamored with her, and it just pans down over her, her sallow, dead-looking body, and then it just comes down to a fish bottom. There's no legs. Yeah. And uh, the woman, or mermaid, or whatever, wakes up and just scream laughs in his face, and he just runs away. Yeah, I, got, I definitely <laughs> got more of a laugh than a scream out of that. Like, she thinks this is hilarious. Yeah. I don't know. I, I was thinking that she is a mermaid, but I, for some reason I conflated her with a mermaid and a siren. I just thought maybe the only way she could talk would be horrible, high-pitched you know, screams, basically. Uh, like, just like Flipper? Yeah, kind of. I mean, it might explain why it would lure people to their deaths on the rocks as a siren. I mean, it could be the same creature. I guess it doesn't have to be. But I was just thinking, you know, when you're underwater, you yeah, you make this, you make the flipper noises. Also, wait a minute. Does anyone even know what a flipper is anymore? Uh, no, the people who get it, well, that's a special treat for them. You know, it's a black and white show from what was it, the '60s, I think. Well, it was about a dolphin. Check out the flipper wiki. The, uh, nineteen. Yeah, this is important, people. Nineteen sixty-four. Also, that actress is Moldovan. Ah. Moldova. Yeah, from Moldova. Wait a minute. So that it, not Moldovia? Uh, no, Mo Moldova. Okay. Wait, where the hell is that? Uh, it's in Eastern Europe, near Romania and 
bartering Ukraine. Oh, okay. I thought for a second it was one of the three sisters. I'm now I'm a little embarrassed. Like, oh yeah, I'm sure it's right next to Lithuania or Estonia. All right. Well, anyway, back to Flipper. Okay. The main subject of this podcast. Back to Flipper. Exactly. Yeah, that was about a trained dolphin that they made a show about. I don't even remember how they involve the dolphin in the business of humans because they're in two different mediums. You know, one's in water, one's on land. But mostly they would just talk to Flipper and then they would throw him fish. And I'm sure the dolphin liked doing the show because he liked fish. Yeah. I only remember a little bit. I mean, they they usually, like, have fish stuff or, like, sea stuff happen. Like, you know, someone, like, found some, like, buried treasure at sea or two, like... People were, were yeah. like holding some some guy hostage on a boat, or there was like I, I don't know why I remember this one, but there was one with like a manta. They had to like track it down. Oh, I, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, it's sort of like in Superman stuff where women, especially Lois Lane, are always falling off of buildings just so that he can catch them. So I, I would assume for a dolphin thing, a dolphin show that all the most important things would happen in the ocean because he's in the ocean. Yeah, yeah. I assume Aquaman is similar. Oh, God, some of these, like, I'm, okay, no, no, we're not, we're not getting any, no, let's move on. We're not doing more flipper. Stop, stop, stop. <laughs> I'm just thinking, stop. maybe we should, we should, maybe we should sidetrack the whole thing. No, stop. Just talk only about. No, 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 no. stop yeah. me. Move on, stop me. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Winslow and Wake finally do wait for the boat to take him away, and it does not come. You know, they're just kind of standing out by the water. So, I don't know, maybe he was doing some duties before he left. So that means he was throwing the chamber pots, shoveling the coal, and then hallucinating about a mermaid, and then the boat doesn't come. So, I mean, that was a pretty busy day for him, if that's the case. Yeah. Well, I mean, how long can it really take to, like, take out the chamber pots? Yeah, I guess it's more memorable than it is time-consuming. Yeah. While shoveling the coal into the... I'm not sure what it is. A, like a steam engine or something. Mm. Defoe barges in and says the rations are low because the storm has ruined them. Mm -hmm. I don't know how a storm could ruin rations. Maybe it flooded a room. Maybe they left a window open and it just blew rain all over everything. Yeah, that's, that was my thinking. It was... It's not explained. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a lot of ways water can ruin your rations. Yeah, or maybe Willem Dafoe just threw them all into the ocean because he's crazy. Yeah, that's also a possibility. Here's where it starts getting very strange. I mean, it was strange before, but now it's real strange. Because uh, Winslow says uh, he's only been there one day since the drunken stupor. How could it be so low? And Wake says it has been weeks, literal weeks since then. I don't know if Wake is making it up or if Winslow is crazy mm -hmm. or both. I guess you could still be crazy and have someone lying to you. It could just be all of the above. Yeah. You know, there is a bit of a hopeful spot for them because they do have, turns out, some extra supplies buried uh, out near the lighthouse. <laughs> yeah, they do. <laughs> oh, yeah, Wake, Wake says, oh, we got to go and get the emergency rations. <laughs> Yeah, we gotta we gotta dig up the emergency stuff, and he's just like, all right, what is it? You know, and they dig it up, and it's just cases of of gin. Yeah, just just gin bottles galore. I did think that was a little weird. I I looked it up, and I guess gin was super popular at the approximate time this movie was uh, just said. So it's it's a period yeah. period out al uh, appropriate uh, alcohol for uh, for the setting. You know, that was a big thing. They used to use that term uh, gin joints for just cheap booze establishments, and they thought that they were ruining society. Yeah. Because the gin was so inexpensive to make that it was just, everybody was drinking it. It was, it was like the Four loco of its time, you know? Yeah. Speaking of which, I went to the university that did the Four loco thing that became world famous. It was the same year that I went there, too. Oh. Did you do it? No. I wish I had <laughs> just to contribute, but no, I, no, I, I was a good boy, but, um, it was near Ellensburg in a place called Roslyn and a bunch of freshman kids went to some kind of a, a party 
it's exactly the kind of party where Jason would show up and murder everyone. <laughs> they were just drinking heavily and screwing and fighting and whatever. They were all mostly new to drinking. And then they did Four Locos, you know, which gives you a ton of caffeine all at once because yeah. it's an energy drink. But it also gives you a lot of cheap grade alcohol all at once. So you are really inebriated, but you don't really feel it. So they drank way too much and they started falling down. And somebody called either because it was a nuisance or because someone was concerned. When the police showed up, it was like a bomb had gone off. There was just bodies everywhere. People passed out. <laughs> they also thought there was an unconsensual act going on. It turns out it was consensual. Essentially, nothing really happened besides the fact that a bunch of people had passed out and then everyone overreacted. But this became a global issue uh, where they, they outlawed for a loco in a lot of places or they I think they eventually made them take. I forget which one did they take out? Did they take out the alcohol or did they, did they take out the caffeine? Uh, I think they took out the caffeine. Yeah, I, I feel like it has more impact as a crappy alcohol, even if it doesn't have the jolt anymore. Yeah. So, I mean. Also, I don't know that it was ever justified in the way that people reacted to it. I just think that some, I don't know, occasionally people kind of just want a scapegoat for stupid childish behavior. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, it's not like you can be prevented from drinking, you know, something like, I don't know, vodka and a Red Bull or whatever. <laughs> I guess they just don't want it all in one thing. Didn't someone uh, die from Four Loco? All right, I, not that I remember, but I, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Okay, I, yeah, not to like spread like false information because like, I think feels like the kind of thing that someone would make up. It also feels like Four Loco probably could kill you. Yeah, you know, I just realized that at least part of my college experience really was like the bad movies, like from the eighties, like the bad sex comedies. For well, instance, good for they you, had Peter. a game. Yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't well I know I didn't do it no you know that's the worst part is that you know I was getting almost perfect grades at the time because I was bored out of my mind and it was an easy university no I did not not to brag I like I actually think it was an insult it just it was an easy <laughs> university but uh <laughs> but no things would happen around me and then I would just be sort of like huh like my roommate was telling me about a game that some of them had with four loco where they, they called it, uh, I think they called it Johnny Four Loco Hands, where they would tape <laughs> Four Locos to your hands. Yes. And you wouldn't be able to take them off until you had finished both of them. <laughs> oh, man. So I don't know. Maybe it was a problem. I know. I don't know. Maybe, yeah, maybe I was too hard on the people who wanted to get rid of it. <laughs> I, dude, if it wasn't Four Loco, it'd be something else. Yeah. And I'm sure it definitely is something else now oh, yeah. okay so anyway that was a tangent from gin which they're drinking in this movie yeah so wake tells winslow that scurvy ended his career on the sea scurvy i forget it has various bad effects but i think one of them is that it weakens your bones or at least makes it harder for you to move around mm-hmm. and winslow says hey wait a minute i thought you told me a different story about breaking your leg and then being holed up with a bunch of Catholic nuns. I believe that was sometime earlier. One of That might have been when they were drinking together on his last day together. Wake says he must have misheard. So once again, I don't know if Winslow did mishear or maybe if Wake is lying and is just making up stories every time he tells it. Mm. Is he like the, the Joker from Dark Knight where it's just every time he talks about his scars, it's a different thing? I don't know. Yeah, I, well, I'm going to say no to that because I really hate comparing uh, the lighthouse to uh, the Joker in any way. <laughs> Winslow. Oh, yeah. This, this is when it really gets to just the real serious and, and awesome monologues and speeches. And, oh, yeah. And just acting. My, acting. My favorite scenes coming up. Yeah. Well, first off, there's that scene, you can find the clip online, where they just say what to each other, like, 70 times. <laughs> yeah. What? 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 
I forget if it even leads anywhere. I just feel like they're just confronting each other, but neither can decide on what. Yeah. So they just say what to one another. Winslow insults Wake's cooking. Wake seems genuinely hurt by it. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, yeah. I wrote a note about that. He, he seems, like, really sad about it. It made me feel bad. Yeah. You liked my lobster, didn't you? <laughs> Admit it. Admit you liked the lobster. I, I, in fact, uh, he's so hurt by this that uh, he gives the uh, greatest uh, monologue in this entire movie. Not just in this movie. It might be one of the greatest monologues in cinema. Like, it's just amazing. Oh, it's so good. Yeah, he just, yeah, he just, he just stands up and just delivers the most damning, great and terrible sea curse from Poseidon himself. Yeah. The speech is just the stuff of legends. It goes on for minutes. He just calls down every bad thing upon Winslow for insulting his cooking. It's, it's just wonderful. Yeah. Also, to be clear, uh, it's Neptune, not Poseidon. Is it Neptune? Yeah. Not Poseidon? Yeah. Well, no, wait, how do you know that? Because I'm, Does he say it? Because I'm watching, yeah, he says, Hark, Neptune. <laughs> yeah. I could have sworn he said Poseidon. Oh, and Triton. I'm sorry, but, everybody. Uh, he was nuts. Anyway. He's just calling upon everybody. Oh, yeah. Okay, so, in the face of just such an awe-inspiring curse... Winslow relents and admits he likes Wake's cooking. Uh, <laughs> I mean, what else, do you, what else do you do after hearing a curse like that? Yeah, I mean, I think he was probably just pushing his buttons anyway. And they're and they're both smashed on gin. I think maybe he just didn't realize he was going to call his bluff and call down a terrible curse upon his head. <laughs> they're just not liking his lobster. Yeah. Like, all right, all right, all right. In preparation for this episode, I read a Vice article about living on nothing but alcohol for five days, uh -huh. where one of their writers did that. So I, I looked it up online, and apparently you can live for maybe a month on alcohol, which is interesting because I also heard you can not starve to death for about a month. So I wonder if the dying in a month from drinking is more from just the ill effects it has on you, because I hear that when you're drinking nothing but but alcohol, it has a uh, progressively worsening effect on you, you know, on your liver, on your kidneys, to the point where you just can't process the alcohol anymore. I mean, I mean, I mean like I, I, I've, I've drank before, but like, yeah, I mean, like, if you if you do it for several days in a row, it does. Uh, it's not great. Don't do it. Yeah, the guy in the Vice article, he made a, I don't know, a meal list out of alcohol. <laughs> Although every kind of alcohol he drank it had various other ingredients to try to keep him alive, you know? So he would have some with like eggnog in it. Oh, that's cheating. Well, the biggest one was he had this Russian drink where apparently you're supposed to chase it with a pickle. So he was able to eat a pickle, <laughs> but even still he said he had in, in just, I think he gave up after three or four days cause he was uh, pooping blood. He said he had bad back pain and he thought it was because I don't know, of sleeping bad or strain or something. Mm -hmm. But then he realized it was just his kidneys acting really inflamed, you know, and this is just a couple of days. Yeah. He hated being uncomfortably drunk all the time and how time just stretched on forever. <laughs> it sort of gets you trapped in a perpetual nightmare. So I imagine all of that on the characters at this point, because they might have a little bit of food left, but basically they're just drinking gin until they die of it. Yeah. Also, they appear to be trapped in a storm. Yeah. So, yeah. To, to be clear, too, anyone listening to this, don't, for, like, funsies, try and do a uh, the lighthouse challenge. That's just, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Not gonna... yeah, don't bird box this, guys. Yeah. Like I was saying, there's there have been studies where if you do it too, if you drink too much consecutively, it does lasting and eventually permanent damage to your internal organs. It's not good. Yeah. It's not a good look. So don't do that. And don't do Johnny for loco hands either. Don't do any of the things I talk about. I didn't do them. I just heard about them. All right. It was legends of college and not the good kind, the stupid kind that, that the failures who usually drop out did, you know? Okay. 
So Winslow tries to break back into the lighthouse lamp room. Mm -hmm. I think he's doing it with a dagger or a lock pick. I'm not sure what, but uh, he no. breaks it. So uh, that sucks. And this is when I realized it wasn't a shrine that Wake's character was in earlier, you know, Willem Dafoe. Mm -hmm. It's a cool cabinet desk. It fo folds up and locks. And I only know this now because Winslow breaks into it to look through his notes. But he doesn't find what he's looking for. So then he goes to try to steal the keys from Wake because Wake is laying passed out. So he leans over him and, and Wake, Wake awakes, which is hard to say. And then he farts. And I was just thinking that that was a, a great chemical defense weapon. You know, someone sneaking up on oh, you. Oh, yeah. And this whole time, Winslow had his hand in his pocket. So I assume he also is just idly considering murdering him I, I think yeah it's not clear i mean he had a knife to his throat i, th yeah, oh, I think it's pretty clear he wanted to uh or was at least like given serious thought to kill him yeah i, I don't remember where his yeah where his other hand was i thought it was in his pocket but if it's not then it, you know, it, it was in his yeah, pocket even more but... clear i thought Maybe he was just thinking about it. No, it was in his pocket, but he had he had the knife to his throat. He was, like, giving it some thought. <laughs> Winslow curses Wake as tolerable only when he works. <laughs> which I, I I thought that was a funny insult for some reason. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> like, you're, you're only bearable when you're doing something else and you're too distracted to be yourself. Winslow lets too much water in the wheelbarrow for the coal. Yeah. He then fantasizes or, or maybe remembers having sex with a mermaid as he um, uh, gets intimate with himself. I mean, this is that scene. Yeah. So, yeah. I will say. Or how'd you put it earlier? Jacking it? <laughs> yeah, be, yeah. Beaten off. I will say, as much as I like this movie, this movie did definitely ruin the fantasy of uh, having sex with a... Uh, mermaid because i guess i just never considered that she'd be yeah. all fishy down there and what that would look like exactly yeah not yeah and they and they show you and uh and it's just as gross as you might imagine and interspersed in between shots of him by himself holding the mermaid scrimshaw and him on top of a mermaid there's also scenes of uh, a man with his back turned in water with logs all around him. Yeah. He's got blonde hair and he, yeah. And he's just kneeling there. And so it's, there's this weird mix of things. So he, he um, you know, finishes with a loud, pathetic moan, which is just I mean, great. He, yeah. He's just, he's, <laughs> he's crying. And jacking off. Yeah. All drunk on Jim. And so I wonder. A very, very relatable part of this movie. It's a very, it's a very complicated scene where you know a lot of things are happening internally. It seems like a some kind of bizarre catharsis, where he's just mingling up what maybe I don't know guilt with, with lust and loneliness and just desperation. Yeah. Winslow then, I hate that I keep starting these these little snippets, but just Winslow does this, Winslow does that. But that's kind of the movie. There's just a series of scenes we're presented with, and we have to just make heads or tails of it. Yeah. So then there's a scene where Winslow pulls up the lobster cage and finds a man's head in the cage used as lobster bait. Dun, dun, dun. Oh. I assume that was the former assistant. Yeah. I, I don't know if it was for sure. I'm not sure. I, I do kind of think it probably is, but also Winslow stabs the uh, idol and breaks it. Yeah. I, I forgot when that happens. I think right after he's done, you know, with himself, he, he throws it and smashes it. And then I think he stabs it with a dagger. Yeah. And then concerning the head, I don't. Yeah. And then there's a severed head in a basket. Concerning the head, though, I, I I'm confused, but I think it wouldn't work because the former assistant, if it was that man's head, it would have had to have been the last time Willem Dafoe you know, Wake's character was on the lighthouse. But they showed a clip at the beginning of the movie with two other people leaving. I mean, the murder of a, an, an assistant would make more sense to me, at least, if, if Defoe was there by himself. 
and they just were replacing the the guy who left. You know, like oh, he 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 ducked out, he got away on the lifeboat, mm-hmm. some kind of lie. But since there was two people who were there, so did they never use the lobster trap? Or I mean, or if there was a head in there, wouldn't it? And there was still a lot of flesh on it. It seems as though it hadn't rotted a lot. You know, and the lobsters are going in there to eat that flesh of whatever you put in there. Usually it's mm-hmm. poultry legs or whatever you have. So it's often believed, at least from when I was looked through some reviews and things, people think that this is almost certainly a hallucination. I don't know. I guess. Yeah. It could just be some random person's head. I, I mean, I suppose so, but what's the point in that? I don't know. One would think at this point that Winslow would accuse Wake of the murder, but instead they are drinking together, singing. It's a, a beautifully awkward scene. Then they do a nice slow dance. Yeah, where where, where Wake just just gently whispers, sings into his ear. Yeah, I will say, wonderful. Uh, speaking of the dancing, they they also do a uh, a wonderful arm in arm dance, which. You know, I feel like we, like, we, and by we I mean dudes, we, we really lost something when we, uh, when we gave up on uh, that cultural tradition of uh, just getting real drunk and just dancing. And I don't know when, I don't know when <laughs> yeah. that happened. But I, it's I a beautiful feel, thing, really. I feel like we're, we're all the poorer for it. Because, like, they are getting, like, yeah. they are, like, full body, just having a dance. Yeah. Just fancy free. I, yeah. Imagine being so uh, uninhibited. Speaking of being uninhibited, yeah, this is the point when <laughs> they go in to... I think they're both considering going in for a kiss, and they kind of think about it in a really awkward way, and then they just kind of back up and they and they <laughs> put up their dukes like they both have to fight for their their masculinity, you know. Now that they mutually compromised it with one another, I guess. Yeah. So they fight for a while, and then they just kind of collapse. And then Winslow says his real name is Tom Howard. So I just wrote, "Who is Winslow?" And then the uh, I was gonna say Winslow again, but no, it's our paths or or Howard. I, I suppose is okay. So, yeah, I Howard we... says uh, it's nobody. I thought we agreed that you weren't going to say our pets. <laughs> I like saying, all right, all right, all right. I'll do my best. All right. Uh, it I, just sounds like a friend of mine, you know? Like, hey, no, it's, my boy, it's my boy, our pets. No, I'm sorry. I, I think I let, I let you slip one by me earlier, but we're not, we're not doing that again. <laughs> all right, all right. So Howard admits he wanted to hit the blonde man from behind with a hook but insists he did not. I think this is the real Ephraim Winslow he's talking about. Howard claims that Winslow, the real Winslow, uh, was crushed by logs, which Howard did not prevent from happening. So I I think it was an accident that was preventable, but he did not do so. Yeah. So then the man just shouts to him, Tom, you dog! (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it was an awkward business, it's a semi-murder, I suppose. So he stole Ephraim Winslow's identity and just tried to start clean, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, it's something he said at the very beginning. I totally forgot about. I, was, I will say this. He's just like, oh, you know, something wrong with a man starting fresh. Yeah. I, that being said, he did. He ethically did kill him. Because, I mean, come on. If you don't, uh, if you can't, if you <laughs> can save someone and you don't, you make that choice, you know. You kill him. Yeah, I, I'd say inaction is an action in, in of itself, you know. Yeah. Then there's a weird scene where where Howard has a vision of, of Wake naked staring him down with lantern like eyes. He just says, Why'd you spill your beans, dummy? Yeah, what was it? That's a reference to a painting. Um it looks like a painting, yeah. Uh, oh, uh, Hypnosis by uh, Sasha Schneider. Cool. Which all of you can look up for yourselves. Absolutely. 
Howard goes to leave in a boat. I, I think it's the only boat they have. And uh, Wake just attacks the boat with an axe. <laughs> he just, just shouts, don't leave me! <laughs> Which is pretty funny. Yeah. I mean, they are in the middle of a storm. I think it might have been more plausible just to be like, hey, don't leave. You might die if you did that. That's true. But, okay, look, I will say this just to be clear. Peter, if you were ever... Uh, if we were ever on an island and you were leaving with the last remaining boat, I would attempt to destroy the boat, even if it meant both of us were getting stranded there and dying. <laughs> Just out of spite. I I don't even. How dare you? I don't think it's like spite. It's just I'm not dying alone here. Sorry. Ah, uh, I would have taken you along. I'm just saying, if you if you had like made the attempt sorry i'm 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 <laughs> sure i'm hacking up that boat so howard accuses wake of the murder of his former assistant and wake just kind of brushes it off without really addressing it which is interesting because it means that we as an audience aren't clear about how true that is mm -hmm. and then after he disregards the accusation he says that howard was the one to wave an axe and smash the lifeboat he asked for our, see, I was about to say it. He asked for Howard's knife, saying he can't be trusted with it and snaps it under his shoe heel. And it's so weird that he totally turns the scene around instantly. Yeah. Howard was accusing him of murder and he's like, it wasn't me acting crazy. It was you. Now give me your knife. <laughs> I honestly, and he just does. He, I mean, the fact that, the fact that he, he went with it, it's just, ah. I mean, he's so slick. I guess. Maybe that means that Howard did that. It allows the possibility, at least, that maybe he's not lying. Maybe Wake is telling the truth. Maybe Howard did smash the lifeboat and threaten him. Uh, and we're just seeing it from an unreliable position. You uh, know, could, like an unreliable narrator. That could be true, yeah. Wake wonders aloud how much time has passed. Clearly more time has passed. We don't know how much. So he's just kind of thinking to himself while he sits around in a gin stupor. You know, he asks whether or not any of this is real or if he's just some figment of Howard's imagination. Regardless, they get drunk and uh, a great storm rages outside, crashing a monstrous wave down on them, damaging their quarters. Now that's the kind of wave that would damage rations. Because after this point, there's windows that are caved in and there's stuff floating around in water. Mm -hmm. If they had done this first, it would have been more plausible. But because they didn't do that, it means that now we don't really know what happened to the rations. You know, it could even be that the rations are there. And, <laughs> and Wake is just a crazy person that just wants them to only drink gin. Yeah, I heard the say. See, where are we? Amidst the floating wreckage, Howard finds Wake's managerial journal he punches and destroys a glass clock with his bare fist after reading it <laughs> you ever been that angry which is pretty great hmm I yeah you know i think i did put a fist through a wall once when i was a kid huh. i think it was because my my brother was making too much noise in the next room and i wanted him to shut up so i just kept kicking the wall until it was too no yeah it was my foot it wasn't my fist yeah <laughs> I just wanted to be taken seriously. <laughs> Is that too much to ask? I mean, look. Wake points out the wound. Wait, what was it? Uh, I was just going to say, I mean, look. It's fine to be angry, but I mean, that, that wasn't your wall. I did fix it okay, later. Right. With putty. I did a terrible job. It left a weird lump on the wall. Which I think is there to this day. Awesome. So, um, yeah, Wake points out the wound on his hand. You know, on, on Howard's hand after he punches the clock. Yeah. And he says he's had that wound since he heard it getting off the boat at the very beginning. I don't know if that's true. He's just making stuff up now. <laughs> so Howard just blows up and calls him a liar. Says he's stinky and gross. And <laughs> what, what did he say? He's, it smells like old jism. It's just, oh, God. It's just a terrible stream of insults. And your goddamn farts. Yeah, I was about to say, and your goddamn farts. <laughs> yeah, he does also say, yeah, he smells like just some, like, rotten dick and curled, yeah, uh, curled, 
curdled foreskin. There you go. That was it. Oh boy. <laughs> I mean, all of that's probably true, but that's still pretty harsh to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you can tell it's just a man at the end of his rope. He's just so sick of this guy <laughs> and his nonsense <laughs> and his bad smells. Yeah. In response, Wake just relieves him of his duties. So Winslow pulls out the journal and points out that Wake has said for weeks that he's been derelicting his duties, he's been missing, slovenly, violent, drunk while on duty, which may or may not be true. You never see any of it in the film. Uh, I mean, he, he does seem like he's been drinking on duty. At the very least. Could. Yeah, that, that could be true. I don't know for sure. I know there is that one scene, remember when he's up on the lighthouse and he says he's getting high marks in his book. If that scene is real, then it would be odd that he would say that and then he would keep writing down all this mean stuff in his journal. Yeah. I don't know. Or maybe he was just saying the high marks thing just to get him to go up on the lighthouse and do a job that he really didn't want to do himself. Because <laughs> <laughs> it was a terrible job. Howard denies it all, but begs for the opportunity to see the lighthouse's light up close. I love that he's, he doesn't care about anything anymore. He's like, I don't even care if I get paid. That's the whole point I'm here. You know, I've, I've gone through so much crap. I've done so much work. I just want to go look at the lamp. <laughs> and, he's, and Wake refuses. That's my favorite he, thing. He's just like, no! Yeah. A thousand times, no! <laughs> yeah, I mean... Like, I, <laughs> Like, I said earlier, this is a, a movie that asks more questions than it answers, but it's just like, it really makes you yeah. wonder what the hell is up there, where he doesn't just, like, that would so easily diffuse the tension if he'd just yeah. go let him take a look. That's all it required. Maybe he was afraid he would blow the lights out. Oh, maybe. So Wake gets real mad, calls him a dog. A filthy dog! And they they fight again. Yeah. Amidst the fight, Howard suddenly finds himself in the arms of the mermaid. Oddly. So he goes in for a kiss and then finds himself ensnared in the slimy grip of Wake, bedecked in barnacles like he's the god of the sea himself. Yeah, there's some... I guess this is a hallucination. There's some psychology going on there. Yeah, maybe. Or maybe he's revealing himself as the god of the sea. Uh, a trickster god. Yeah, could be. I will say, uh, it is also very clear how much fun Willem Dafoe is having filming that scene, because he is just grinning. Yeah. He's loving it. Yeah, he's got a big old smile on his face. Like, he's really enjoying himself. So, in response, Howard punches the vision away. He beats Wake into submission until he screams that he's, you're killing me! You're killing me! And then, after that, he just seems utterly defeated. He's laying there nearly dead. And so Howard gets him to bark and roll over like a dog. Which he does. He puts him on a leash and leads him outside like he's walking a dog. Yeah. And I was just thinking, how did we get to this <laughs> point in the movie? Yeah, things went really off the rails. Like, how Yeah, how did we get to where one of the men would be leading the other just around on all fours like a dog and making him bark? How did we go from <laughs> drinking gin, beating off, and crying to this? Howard leads him a short way over to... I think it's the, the pit that they dug to get the gin. Yeah. It would explain why there's a hole there. So they, he puts him in a hole and just starts to bury him alive. And just in desperation, while he's laying there dying, Wake calls down a curse of Prometheus on him, I think. Yeah. A it's a little hard to tell. Promethean fate. Wake makes another, he makes another fine speech, I'd say. It's how we're just, it's just throwing shovelfuls of dirt right in his face. Man, that must have been horrible to film. Oh, yeah. How many takes did they have to do where Willem Dafoe is, is, is making these awesome lines and they're just throwing dirt right in his face? <laughs> You'll be punished! <laughs> I 
I heard that the shoot for this was quite harsh, and I bet that this was probably the worst scene for for Defoe by far. It's got to be. I mean, you can see it. They also do just throw dirt right into his face. It's not an exaggeration. Yeah, He's, I don't mean like he yeah, swallows. I don't some mean of it at one like. Point. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, it's it, it looks like real dirt or something close enough. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean like they, they Hollywood threw it at him like little specks. I mean, like they full on, it looks like just real shovel fulls of just dirt, just right in his face. Yeah. <laughs> it was a 38-day shoot in a, the miserable Nova Scotian weather <laughs> of Canada. Wonderful. Well, at least it's kind of location adjacent. You know, this is supposed to be sort of in the New England area. Mm -hmm. Although to me it looks a little colder and frostier than that, I actually think it's appropriate for where they actually filmed it. You know, in uh, in Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. I guess it doesn't really matter where they are. I mean, other than the fact that they seem vaguely American-ish. Yeah. But I mean, otherwise, it doesn't make a lot of difference. No, and I mean, I feel like it's hard to like find a place as wildly isolated looking as that. Yeah. So I, I don't blame them for not. Just finding a, bleak. a location that's like accurate to the setting like that's it's almost like a uniquely isolated looking area yeah he just half buries him howard gets him i don't know about halfway and then wake just seems to die or pass out yeah it's not really clear which i don't know why he thought it was okay but it could just be that they're both so drunk that it's all just madness. You know, like maybe he just started the task and then he just forgot or gave up. <laughs> you know, just like, eh, I'm done with this. Yeah. I'll, I'll bury you the rest of you later. And so he searches his body for the keys and heads his way up to the, to the lighthouse. But before he does, he goes to just kind of hang out. I'm not sure where he's going, like into the pantry or something. Yeah, I'm not sure what he was getting. He's just, yeah, he just kind of pauses there for a while, which in a way, to me, that's even more insane that he, he's just like, ah, you know, I'm going to take a break from my murdering, you know, before I go check out the thing. <laughs> he's just taking a little time out. Yeah. A little PB and J break. If they had it, I guess it's all just gin at this point. Yeah. And, and so Wake runs in with an ax. I think close. He says, that light belongs to me. The closest thing this movie has to a jump scare, right? Like, legitimately yeah. surprised me the first time i watched this movie <laughs> yeah i did not see that he just runs in and just he just runs in and just he just lays a blow into our see i keep almost saying it yeah it's no, howard's shoulder yeah come on it is a surprisingly a unremarkable singer. and ineffective hit yeah uh just like a little wound. I mean, I appreciate the effort, but, uh, I mean, I feel like if you get a hit, it, it like, let him, you know, with an axe, like, come on. It's just like a kind of a little wound. Maybe because of how drunk he is, he didn't feel it very much. I, I think that makes sense. Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, I've never been hit with an axe while drunk, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't have any personal experience. <laughs> yeah, well, if you add it to your bucket list. Yeah. So... Howard knocks Wake down and just finish him, finishes him with the axe. Mm -hmm. Just a couple of blows off screen. And uh, that's the end of him, I guess. Yeah. Rip Wake, the old salty sea dog, who may or may not have been taken out of service for scurvy, or maybe for breaking his leg. Uh, we don't know. And who may or may not be Triton. Maybe, yeah, maybe. Who knows? Howard just straight up drinks the lamp fuel kettle. He just drinks out of that. Yeah. I don't know. I thought it was kerosene, but I was reading later that they were maybe making some booze out of turpentine and honey. So maybe, I don't know, maybe the second case was, wasn't was gin. Maybe it was turpentine. I, I don't know. That would be so much worse. Uh, what, yeah. Well, which, are, yeah, it seems like they would have died sooner if that was the case. Yeah. Because at this point, he's pretty casual. He's just like, you know, I'm just going to drink this. I don't even know what it is. So maybe they brewed alcohol to fuel the light. That would almost make sense. I thought maybe that's why they were shoveling the coal, but I, I can't prove that. I don't know what processes they were doing there. Yeah, I'm not a alcoholologist. It's possible. Alkeologist? Al yeah, yeah. Look, look, I just drink the stuff. I don't know how the science works. Yeah, I don't know where it's from. 
So yeah, Howard finally, reverently, makes his way up the long spiral stair of the lighthouse. He slowly climbs into the lamp room. The lamp is beautiful. It's ornate and faceted. It looks like something that would have come from the land of Oz. Yeah, it, 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 is, it, is, it is beautiful. It's very nice looking. In an age of grime, <laughs> of filth, of death and drinking, there's this one beautiful, glorious thing. It looks like a giant gem. It's Yeah, it's wonderful. Or at least the focal lens is, you know, the outer part. You don't really get to see the inside. No. But Howard does. <laughs> he opens it up and just reaches inside. And you don't know what he's reaching for. All you do is see him react yeah. and it's weird because when he reaches in it's normal light you know normal brightness yeah maybe a little brighter than normal because he's in something bright but then he reaches in and it gets brighter and i was i don't know for sure but i would assume that's his hand catching on fire yeah i'm not yeah, i'm not sure about that i mean i feel like if there are answers to a lot of this stuff it's got to be something more esoteric or mystic than that I'm sure that's what they want. I, I'm just trying to think of every <laughs> every weird eventuality that might have happened. Yeah. But yeah, it gets brighter, and he starts to... I think at first it looks almost more like a pleasure yell or, or a laugh, and then it turns into a scream, mm -hmm. and it's, it's really low and really distorted. Yeah. You don't really see what happens, but he falls out of the lamp room, Mm -hmm. And then just somehow falls all the way down the entire spiral stair. Every single one. Yeah. All the way down. And the scene fades out. Which is good, because if they hadn't faded out, you would have to explain what happened. And because you... <laughs> <laughs> because they didn't, now you don't know what's happening. So it's you could be anywhere, you know? And, and indeed you are. Because when they fade back in, Howard's bloody naked body still alive and breathing, is being devoured by seagulls out on the shore. Uh, he could be... So I've heard some people say that they see logs out there. I thought they looked like rocks. Yeah. But it could be it could be logs. Oh, there is also... A, that are around him. An interesting detail I noticed. The birds huh. uh, the, also pooped on him. <laughs> so. Well, you know, they're disrespectful that way. Yeah. Yeah, so either he's on the shore of the island, although I don't know why he's naked. I mean, did he take his own clothes off? I don't think he would have had time to have done that after he fatally hurt himself on the stairs, right? Uh, no. Or, I don't know, or maybe he really hurt himself on the fall down the stairs, stripped off his clothes in a drunken stupor, and then collapsed outside, or only to be attacked by really hungry seagulls. Or maybe it was the Dread Emperor himself. It's the Promethean curse yeah. that Willem Dafoe's character laid down on him. Oh yeah, I actually wrote that. He is tormented and devoured like Prometheus. The fire of the lighthouse was too much. <laughs> Jesus, Peter. <laughs> the end. Uh, the end, Jacob. That's the movie. Woo! Fade to black. Yeah. I know there's been a lot of confusion as I've explained this. I don't think I've done a great job, honestly. I don't feel worthy of even explaining it. But I just want to say now that I just find this to be an excellent, awesome movie. This is like one of the better, maybe one of the best horror movies I've seen, possibly, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's weird because it also, like, it feels even, I mean, I, I like the horror genre, but it feels like a reductive, almost in a way, to uh, call a horror movie. It, yeah, that's the worst thing. When you get a really good horror film, people don't want to call it a horror film anymore. Well, because, well, well, I mean, like, there are so many more more elements to it than the horror, though. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not sure if... Yeah, well, I mean, you don't even necessarily have to even categorize it that way. You know, it just depends on how you wish to interpret the movie. Yeah. Speaking of which, let me just run through a few possible scenarios... As they occurred to me. I mean, I think we've already discussed quite a few of these, but I actually made a list. All right. And just in case I missed any, I'm going to go through these. Okay. Hit me. All right. 
So scenario one, I mentioned this at the beginning. Tom Howard never went to the lighthouse and the entire movie is a hallucination of his mind as he lay dying in Canada, having been crushed by the logs rather than Ephraim Winslow. Um, plausible, but I don't like it. Is it is, yeah, I guess... that's an, that's an, I hate it. <laughs> yeah. It's like, uh, it, maybe, but that means, but no. that means basically the only, yeah. I mean, the, it means the only true thing that happened in the movie where, uh, you know, a handful of those shame flashbacks yeah. and then him being dead at the end. Yeah. <laughs> and, and like, I mean, Wins Winslow even alludes to that possibility, but I I don't like it. Yeah, it reminded me of an incident at Owl Creek. You know the Ambrose Ambrose Bierce story, where a, a man's about to be hung, and then the the rope snaps. He goes home to his family, and you know he's about to hug his wife, and then it goes right back to him on the rope, and it you know he's being hung. Yeah. Also made. In, I don't know if you ever heard of that story. Yeah, I've read it, and it was also made into a, an episode of, uh, shoot. Which one was uh, it? Twilight Zone. Like, Night Gallery? Twilight Zone. Oh, ah, yeah. okay. Yeah, so I, I mean, I'm not saying that's a satisfying ending. It's just, I'm just saying there is some precedent for that sort of ending to exist. Sure. Okay, so scenario two. Tom Howard is an unreliable narrator. Everything Wake says about him slacking off and being violent is true. Howard only hallucinated the assistant's head in the lobster cage. And uh, possibly the thing that Wake said about him wounding his hand at the beginning is also true. So it's, it's possible that he's dying of an infection or hallucinating from an infection. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's similar to, to one, but it's a little less lame. I mean, more of it is true. Uh, you know, more of the movie is true. Yeah, I like that a little bit more, but it's still, like, I don't know. Not ideal. I don't like the idea of Tom Wake's character being totally innocent, because he's such a son of a bitch <laughs> in the story. Yeah, also that. I'm sorry, he's not getting off yeah. scot-free. <laughs> yeah. All right, scenario three. Tom Wake is insane from loneliness and boredom. Everything he said about Howard is untrue. He killed his assistant and then claimed the man had delusions that Wake himself possessed. Okay. I mean, plausible. Yeah, I like that. That lines up with more of the story. Yeah, I do think uh, of the theories, I think that one's the most interesting to me. Because it like it allows for like, yeah. the most of the movie to happen. Yeah, and it also allows for a certain amount of vulnerability. I mean, you could see that in Wake's character when he's when he's attacking the boat with the axe. You know, he just says, "Don't leave me." Yeah, and you know, like there's a, a patheticness to it. Mm -hmm. All right, now here's scenario four. All right. The cistern is foul and poisonous. They are both insane and hallucinating from bacterial infection. But does Wake ever even drink water? I don't know. I would assume. I guess. I mean, I, you gotta, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm not so sure about that one. I mean, you would also use the water for food prep. I mean, you know, making soup and stuff. But Let's, I suppose you probably boil it at that point. Yeah. I guess I'm not quite as... I was just taken aback by how foul they made the cistern look. It just seemed real <laughs> gross. So I was just thinking, like, well, I don't know, maybe they're just both hallucinating. Yeah. Which means that both or neither of, of any of the scenes, everyone's story could or could not be true. Sure. Yeah, I feel like that almost okay. That <laughs> almost leaves like too much up in the air, you know? Yeah, it's it's too hazy at that point. You're just like, I don't know what's happening. Well, it would give no answers and no real conclusion. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's scenario five. Tom Wake is Poseidon, or a demigod from the sea. <laughs> Hell. His only purpose yeah. is to trouble... <laughs> yeah, his only purpose is to trouble the lives of lost men like Tom Howard. He summons mermaids and angry gulls to lead Howard to some inevitable death. Oh, yeah, and there was a scene in the movie where Tom Howard claims that the mermaid Scrimshaw was a charm. Mm that Wake was using against him and he broke the charm, so he broke the curse. Yeah. I mean, you see multiple mermaid shots 
you see seagulls acting weird. There is a weird mermaid that was put in his bed. I mean, either it was an accident or on purpose. Hmm. And then he claims, Howard claims it has an effect on him. So, I mean, you know, I, it's possible, I guess. Okay, when I, when I said early on that I, I like the most literal possible interpretation of the movie, that's that's up there. With like, yeah, sure, why, why not make all the weird stuff true? Yeah, it's on two assumptions. One, Wake is a god. <laughs> two, Wake is still a son of a bitch. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the two go hand in hand so often. Yeah. Okay, so here's the last one. Right. Six. Neither man is insane, but both are bitter, unlikable men that deliberately lie and misinterpret things about one another as a means to antagonize. They grow insane as they drink themselves to death. I mean, I think that's just true. I mean... Re like, regardless of... Regardless of which theory is true, that, that part is true. That's just what the movie is. Yeah. I mean, they are bitter, unlikable men. They do antagonize one another. They do drink themselves to death. Six could be the most likely, but it is almost a non-answer. Because if they're both lying, it's the same as them both being insane. You don't know what's true anymore. Yeah. I think it works on the assumption that Howard's perspective would be more true. Mm. You know, as it would be almost more of a, just a straight, a fiction story, you know, rather than a horror or something. Yeah. Speaking of which, if this is a horror movie, it's got a body count of one, I guess. Maybe two. Well, three max. Okay, yeah. So I guess Ephraim Winslow sort of, but that's more of a flashback. Yeah. And he also might not be dead. I'm, I mean, he's probably dead. I mean, uh, <laughs> was there how many people died in the... I mean, not to, to like spoil another movie, how many people died in The Witch? Uh, the dad, the mom... That might be it. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, you can you can have a horror movie that's good and has a, uh, yeah. Oh, wait, uh, the son died too. Oh, yeah. well, I mean, that's just... and the baby. Oh, the whole family's dead. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I guess. But I mean, like, point being, that's a pretty low body count. Yeah. Yeah. I don't... except for Black Philip. I mean, that's the important thing. Oh well, yeah, he lives on. Actually, you know, I do. That does bring up. An interesting idea. I do feel like horror movies that have lower body counts, I think, trend on average to being better. You know, or or I guess, really, like actual good yeah. horror movies tend to have lower body counts. Maybe is how I'd phrase that. Well, it's a it's a question it's a question of um, emphasis about where the emphasis is on a film. You know, because if you're not wasting time with with kills with gore, with the effectiveness of a scene like that, then you have more time to fixate on subtlety and nuance. That's not necessarily true. And also this movie, even though it's not got a lot of stuff going on, the stuff that happens is pretty brutal. You know, like when that seagull gets beaten to death on the cistern, that's pretty... <laughs> Should we add that to the body count? That's pretty rough. <laughs> yeah, that seagull. I mean, he does have a soul of a sailor what made his maker. I, yeah. I think it, okay, so, I think it counts. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? So yeah, as we mentioned before, this is loosely based on the Smalls Lighthouse tragedy of 1801. So that's when it was. Mm. It was off the coast of Pembrokeshire and Grassholm in Wales. And uh, that's basically it. I mean, uh, I'm trying to think if there was something else is based off of other than the Edgar Allan Poe thing, but I think... Well, I don't know. See, the weird thing is that they made the movie in 2016, but apparently that movie is not accurate either to what happened. So I guess everyone is just taking the real event and just kind of extrapolating from there. Yeah. Whatever they want out of it. I mean, what is it like? They have like five like Dilatov past movies. <laughs> oh, is that the one where everyone takes off their clothes yeah. and just freezes to death? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen a couple of those, yeah. Uh... Yet to see a good one. Yeah, they're all terrible. <laughs> one day. One day. So, The Lighthouse, the 2019 one, <laughs> has 90% on Rotten Tomatoes. That's like nearly universal praise. Yeah, and all the more impressive for a horror movie. 
Yeah, it got 83% on Metacritic, which is the highest I've ever seen. Yeah. It was nominated for a whole bunch of awards. It, it won, I think, Best Supporting Actor at the Cannes Film Festival. It was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Achievement in Cinematography, which I think it probably should have won. Although I forget who actually won. No, whatever. The, whoever won didn't deserve it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's a beautifully shot film. And honestly, I, I just realized I didn't spend any time talking about how beautiful the movie is. It's a black and white movie. It's a little box of a filming structure, mm. but it's beautiful. It's, it's a, it's a, almost every shot is like a work of art. Yeah. And it really helps propel a movie where almost nothing happens. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just two guys in a remote location, not doing a lot, you know, just sniping at each other. Yeah. I think that's like the movie would be way harder to tolerate if every scene didn't look interesting. Yeah. I mean, and if it was kind of a romantic location in a way, yeah. I mean, like, honestly, even something as mundane as like groping a mermaid is framed perfectly. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I don't remember how much it costs, or maybe I couldn't find it. I, but uh, I found out it only made ten million on its U.S. debut, and then it made eighteen million total worldwide. So it made almost no money. Uh, dude, that sucks. I'm not sure how much it took to, to make the movie. I'm going to guess a couple million. So I, I bet it turned a profit. But this is more of a critical darling rather than a popular one. Yeah. I regret not having seen it in theaters myself. I was going to, but I just I didn't get around to it. I didn't realize that the world was going to descend into plague and you'd never be able to go back for a long time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, last movie I saw in theaters... Birds of Prey. Oh. Oh, is that the, the fantabulous ex- yeah, yeah. Uh, adventures of Harley <laughs> Quinn? Or- yep. Oh, okay. Yeah. I didn't see that. Actually, I heard it wasn't that bad. I, you know, I didn't hate it, but, but, but like, it is very funny to me that that's, like, the last movie that I saw in theaters and uh, probably still will be yeah. the last one for a while. Now it's time for some plot keywords. It's the IMDb keywords game. Ooh, wait, okay, also. Well, not exactly a game. It's more of a list. Wait, hold yeah. on. Okay, this is, this is like interesting slash depressing. So I guess, uh, according to Wikipedia, box office looks like domestic for uh, The Lighthouse, 18.3 million. Domestic oh. box office for The Bye Bye Man, 29.9 million. <laughs> so you, you know what the people yes. want. Yeah, see, I've said it before. That's the thing. You don't need to make a good horror movie to make money. <laughs> yeah, well, in fact, uh, like making bad horror movies does seem to just make money. I mean, it's there for a purpose, you know? It's it's like the spam of, of canned goods, you know? <laughs> I'm, We're just like, it doesn't have to be great. It just has to fulfill a purpose. I, I, you're not wrong. Get the teenagers but, in the seats. But, god damn it. Yeah. Here is the list of the IMDb keywords for the lighthouse. There's 184 listed. I'm just going to list the top 20 here. Okay. We can, you know, we'll see how well it sums up the thing. Okay, can I predict one of the uh, keywords? Oh, yeah. Uh, fart. Please. Is fart on there? Mm, let me see. Let me see. I feel... I, I feel... I feel like it. I could, I could have sworn I saw it in here. Ah, crap. No, maybe not. See, this is just the top twenty. Uh, there's okay, 184. Okay. There's it, there's got to have been farts in here. Yeah. So sorry, you okay, lose. No, okay. All right. It's fine. <laughs> okay. So here we go. Top twenty. Top twenty. Not bitter. Lighthouse. Okay. Mermaid. Sure. Hallucination. Yeah. I mean, I guess. Uh, lighthouse keeper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sex with a mermaid. <laughs> yeah, definitely. This is just giving you the facts. You need to know this. I mean, you know, if you're if you're curious about whether it happens, this will lay it right out for I you. I mean, I guess I'm also kind of curious how many movies that applies to. It can't be that many. No, it really can't. Yeah, especially when you think of the actual logistics of, of having sex with a mermaid, it, it's it's going to limit 
how many films want to do that? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you really want to get into, you know, the logistics of having sex with a mermaid, it's just very inconvenient. All right. So here's the next one. Right. Uh, Storm. Mm -hmm. Minimal cast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Drunkenness. Oh. oh, yeah. I mean, absolutely. Axe. That, yeah. that one shouldn't be that high up there. I don't like that. <laughs> I don't know if this is in any in any particular oh, okay. order or if it's just random. Because I'm going to say farts are way more relevant. I'm than, not sure. The uh, next is underwater scene. I mean, there's that one part where you see the mermaid. Yeah, coming up. I guess. Yeah, I don't know. Those last two. That's super relevant. Hallucinating. See, earlier I said hallucination, and now it's hallucinating. Sure. Why not? Waste of a slot. Yeah. Madness. Yeah. 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 Nightmare. I mean, probably. Uh, yeah. Some of those things might have been nightmares. It's not clear what is or is not real. I mean, also just... For a lot of the movie. Uh, I mean, also just the scenario is a nightmare. Yeah. Also that, yeah. Uh, 1890s. I don't think that's true. I mean, it could be. It half credit. Why not? I don't actually know. <laughs> sure. I guess it's it's within the 100 year rank. Yeah. Or, you know, range rather. Circular staircase. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Mermaid figurine. Pretty important, yeah. Tentacles. <laughs> that actually is solid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need to know when that's in a movie. How about this one? Work. <laughs> yeah. I will. Okay. I will say going back. To, I mean, honestly, like going back to t tentacles. Though, if you're looking that up for like movies with tentacles in them, I feel like you're inherently going to be pretty disappointed by the lighthouse because you're looking for something else. Well, maybe so. However, they, <laughs> the tentacles in this are pretty good. I mean, for what little there are of them. Sure, yeah. They are effective and gross. Yeah. So, yeah. Work. And then next one is Secret. Yeah. That was number 19. So here's number 20. Killing a Seagull. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay, the list is redeemed. Yeah. As long as you, you end on a high note. Yeah, yeah. That's all you need. We've finally gotten to the point in our podcast where we rate the movie. On a scale of 1 to 10, what would you give it? Uh, Gotta go with a 10 out of 10, man. Wow, really? I, I mean, I like the movie a lot. I don't know what, you know, what would you... Uh, what would you do to improve it? It's, uh, I mean, it, and really, it has everything. Yeah, people going <laughs> yeah, insane. It has a, as much, uh, yeah. you know, like sea madness, uh, tentacles, yeah. you know, implied uh, dark gods and their uh, works upon the world. People drinking gin. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. 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 That's important. Okay, so, yeah, I absolutely love The Lighthouse. I, I would even call it a step up from Egger's previous work, The Witch. Yeah. Which is also excellent. I mean, we already talked about it. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. The movie, makes me, the movie makes me appreciative to be alive at a time when dark stories are done with such care and love. I have no problem sticking this film up with the finest horror movies maybe ever committed to film. This is a 10 out of 10 for me as well. Ooh. It's as near to perfect as a brine-washed tale of maritime sorrow and dread can ever be. <laughs> I, uh, that's also, I think that's a first uh, for both of us, given a 10 out of 10. Yeah. And maybe the first for us to agree on something. <laughs> nah, that's debatable. I don't no, know. No, I, I, I don't know about that. Oh, I mean in the ratings. I, oh, I don't know sure, we, yeah. Oh. No, we're, our, our ratings are... No, no, we've never agreed on anything, Jacob. <laughs> this is 
It's crap. Yeah. And yes, I, I do know, you know, this is just to the audience. I, I know full well that it's just a story of two grizzled, wretched men sniping and farting at one another until they drink themselves to death. Any story can be beautiful if it's magnificently told. With enough love for the subject matter, it, in a way, it's, it really sums up why I love horror movies in the first place. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. It, <laughs> Catching my drift? No, I, I am. Yeah, I think this movie, it's one of those movies where you can like show it to people, and if they're receptive, they'll like understand how good like a horror movie can be. Yeah. I mean, I will put an asterisk on this that it's it may not be a 10 out of 10 for everyone. No. Just because it's a miserable, grimy story of two men just sniping and farting at each other. <laughs> yeah. And that is also a but, very... You know, but for, it's a hard story. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. It probably didn't sell well for just that reason. But for this kind of movie, it is an absolute success. I mean, it is the best version of this movie. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So if you're if you're willing to put up with this premise, this is the one to go to. All right. And I think that just about wraps it up, don't you? Uh yeah, I think so. Oh man. It's been great. I I've it's you know, it's a genuine pleasure doing this movie. I almost dread whatever it is we do next. We're going to have to decide amongst ourselves what the next one will, will end up being. Oh, okay, hold on. We're, don't <laughs> don't and see what you're doing already. I'm gonna put a stop to it. None of this we shit. Yeah, the next we're one switch, might be real off. bad. Yeah, we're switching off and on. <laughs> it's you gotta go after this. So whatever you pick next, yeah. it's on you. It's not on me. To be clear. <laughs> All right then. I've got I've got I've got some ideas up my sleeve. All right. Okay. Well, rather I have one idea. <laughs> Well, uh, I, I can't wait to hear it. <laughs> All right. So until next time, everybody, I've been Peter. Uh, and I'm still Jacob. And this has been Gorman on Gore. See ya. Later. You're a dog, a filthy dog, a dog!